Thank you for joining us at School of Data. Um, while we wait for one of our panelists to come back, I am Naima Hawk, a Civic Innovation Associate at Beta NYC. And for our next session, I have the pleasure of welcoming Ashley Louie, our Chief Technology Officer at Beta NYC, for a panel discussion on public interest AI, the future of generative AI and civic technology. So welcome, Ashley. Thank you, Naima. Is this on? Okay. Great. Um, so my name is Ashley. I am a civic technologist. Um, I have a background in architecture and urban design. And at Beta NYC, I work at the intersection of data visualization, geospatial analysis, and interactive storytelling. Um, we are excited to uh, launch our, one of our latest projects called FloodGen. Um, FloodGen is a tool uh, which uses flood, uh, sorry, it's an advocacy tool that uses AI generated imagery. Um, and FloodGen takes street view images and uses AI, generative AI to render photorealistic images of potential flooding scenarios in order to raise awareness, bolster community preparedness, and support local government resilience strategies. Um, so we're gonna be actually presenting the project a little bit later at, at, at another session. Um, but in light of that, we were thinking a lot about AI and generative AI and how to use it responsibly. Um, so we wanted to invite this panel and put this panel together. Um, so AI is a, a tool that is ever evolving uh, in the, tech, the landscape of technology. There's a lot of opportunities for AI to help automate practices and improve efficiency in government practices um, and could be used for social good in the public realm. Um, yet there are also some serious <coughs> moral and ethical challenges to overcome along the way. Um, so like any other tool, um, AI will be an extension of the hand that wields it. Um, so we have a sort of responsibility in using and impl implementing this technology. Um, yet we are on this sort of path of like technological determinism and there is no uh, stopping progress. So as society becomes, uh, you know, adapts uh, by, by the technology of our age with each generation, um, AI like uh, is no exception and we must always continue to adapt. Um, so I guess like what we're hoping to do with this panel is to discuss the opportunities, uh, the risks and the future of public interest AI. Um, so this is not a discussion to reject the notion of artificial intelligence, but how to embrace it um, open-mindedly. So let's together uh, try to envision a roadmap for how to navigate the promise and peril of incorporating generative AI in civil society and government practices. Um, so I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have um, to my left, uh, Jeanette. Wing, uh, she is the executive vice president for research and professor of computer science uh, from Columbia University. Um, maybe uh, I can ask you each as I like, introduce you to uh, maybe answer a, a quick question. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, okay, next we have. Um, Kristen Gonzalez, uh, she is the New York State Senator and Chair of Internet and Technology Committee uh, for the New York State Senate District 59. Uh, next, we have Reshma Saujani. Uh, she is the founder of Girls Who Code and the founder and CEO of Moms First. Um, and finally, we have Mark Levine. Uh, he is the borough president of Manhattan at the office of Manhattan Borough President. Um, so I'd love you. <laughs> wow, that's, that's a great title. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd be at the Queens Borough President. <laughs> I would love for you all to kind of um, answer a quick question of like, 
you know, what is important to you regarding public interest AI and sort of what, what are you most excited about and what brings you to this discussion today? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I now regret sitting in this chair. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for um, having me here today. Uh, I am uh, very much an advocate for this new uh, wave of artificial intelligence technology, uh, which really started only a few years ago but uh, with deep learning. But I think what has really hit um, all of us by surprise, including the entire computer science community, is large language models and generative AI. And um, the amount of data and the amount of compute needed to build these models and then what one can do with these models is beyond imagination. Um, and already, uh, I think for this particular topic of public interest and civic engagement and using this kind of technology in government agencies, I, I think the it's just the beginning of what we can do. And I, I was here earlier when I heard about open data and, and government access to data. I think that's tip of the iceberg. Um, and now, now that we have all this data available, then we can use these new technologies and in artificial intelligence to really light things up in ways that we could never have imagined before. And we're already seeing the effects of um, large language models, the use of large language models for creativity, um, in the arts, um, to discovering new science, um, and uh, drug discovery in medicine, um, and then of, of course all the potential for education in terms of their personalized learning and so on. So I think there's the, the opportunities are boundless. It's at, the opportunities are only bound by our own creativity. Mm. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, really want to thank Jeanette for that answer. Oh, thank you so much. Um, can you all hear me? Is this good? Good morning. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you for having me. I feel really honored to be part of a panel with some incredible experts, like a fingerling of my own a little bit between these, these folks who've been doing the work um, for so long. Um, so a little bit about myself. I am the state senator for District 59. As you've heard, I chair internet and technology in the Senate. So, um, you know, we're actually in my district right now. It's, it's Western Queens, Northern Brooklyn, East side of Manhattan. Do we have any people from any of the boroughs? The Queens in the house? I see Queens. All right. All right. We got, got some Brooklyn in the house. I know we got some Brooklyn and we got, we got to have Manhattan in the house. We got the borough president. Manhattan, where are we? Okay. Pretty well represented. You got some constituents over here too. Um, but you know, coming into this as a new state senator, um, also as a democratic socialist, I really see my role as listening and learning from a ton of different stakeholders. I think this is one of the few issues where we really need to engage academia, right? The experts who know uh, about all of the incredible opportunities that you know generative AI can can bring to the public sector. I think we need to talk to our community stakeholders, folks who, um, you know, especially communities that would be impacted if this technology was used in a way to surveil or marginalize folks. We also need to talk to the private sector, right? Um, and really understand how they're incorporating this technology and crafting their own internal policies. And so um, I guess to answer the question of just like what our role is or how we're seeing this issue, um, I always like to use the analogy of a car where, you know, generative AI is like a car that can get you to some really cool, exciting new places, but without being a complete downer, because I feel like as the regulator here, <laughs> that's kind of like, that's our job. Um, you know, it's our job to really take that car and start building the right infrastructure. So building the roads, right? Building the stop signs, building the, the lights, you know, coming up with the laws that make the driving safer, um, which doesn't always tend to be the most exciting thing, but I think is really important in this moment where we're really taking off. Um, and in the past, our government has been reactive with policy and not proactive, and we've seen where that's left us, right? So I see us as you know, trying to be proactive in this case, but not too overreaching, listening from a lot of different people, and again, putting the right regulations and right infrastructure so that we can take advantage of this really cool new car. And so I'll stop there. Um, thank you for that. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Rash Visajani. I spent the past uh, decade of my life building an organization called Girls Who Code. Uh, I probably sit here as an 
<clears throat> an AI optimist. Um, I, I, I truly believe uh, in, in something I've been calling aspirational AI, that we have to think about how generative AI can solve our biggest problems like COVID, cancer, and climate. So, you know, when I think about like this moment, I remember, <laughs> I remember, you, probably, you were as old as me, so I remember when I was in college and you couldn't use a laptop. Or I remember being in a workplace and you couldn't use Google search. You know, there are always moments in technology where when a new technology came out, we had a lot of fear about the change that was gonna come. And our immediate reaction was to basically figure out how we take it away from people's hands. And the implications of that way that we have traditionally treated technology has been, has wrecked havoc on women, poor people, and people of color. And, and I say this in the context of, of building Girls Who Code. You know, when, when people forget that the world's first programmer was a woman. You know, in the 1990s, if you went to any gaming camp in America, it would have been half boys, half girls. But then when that technology became lucrative, you started seeing Barbie dolls that said, I hate math, let's go shopping instead. You started watching television shows like Weird Science and Revenge of the Nerds, where this, the prototype of a programmer was a, a, a white dude sitting in a hoodie somewhere drinking a Red Bull, right? And girls and people of color said, not only do I not want to be him, I don't even want to be friends with him. We turned people off. And for 30 years, we have been trying to close the access gap. Today, then the internet came out in the 1990s. And vast majority of black and Latino Americans still don't have broadband internet and broadband access. Because instead of when the technology came out, we didn't, instead of saying, how are we gonna get this in the hands of every single person? We infused fear and distrust, even though the technology was here to stay. So it's the same thing with generative AI. It's not going anywhere. Now that doesn't mean that we can't do regulation and we can't think about risk and bias and making sure that, but what it also means that the people that are often thinking about bias in particular are the most marginalized. And so at the same time, we gotta think about access. We gotta think about, as we're thinking about public interest AI, how am I developing it to, to, to help the most vulnerable? And that's exactly what we did at Moms First. So I'm, again, sitting in rooms where we're having lots of interesting conversations. And in my mind, right, I'm trying to pass paid leave in America, make childcare affordable, two small things. And you know, part of the problem of why we haven't passed paid leave, we're the only industrialized nation that doesn't have paid leave. The vast majority of low-income women go back to work two days after having a baby. It's unconscionable. And you know, the, the, part of the reason why we have not passed it federally is because the 10 states, including New York State, that offer paid leave, the uptake of those benefits is really small. And so part of building a revolution means you have to build that foundation of people who have benefited from that, who can tell you the story about how they got to hold their father's hand the last few minutes before he died because they got time off. Or when their baby was in the NICU, they didn't get fired from their job and they could stay there and make sure that they could take care of her. It is those stories of empathy and love and compassion that lead to real fundamental policy change. So what we did you know, at Moms First was we built a tool called paidleave.ai and it was the first generative AI tool, one of the first tools in the world that had solved a public sector problem using generative AI. And I wanted to do it not only because we had a pass paid leave finally, but I want to inspire people to step in the next moment of change, to be thinking about, again, how do you use tech this technology to increase, for example, the uptake of benefits, whether it's paid leave, whether it's SNAP benefits, whether it's Medicare, whether it's Medicaid, whether it's unemployment insurance, the government sucks at customer service. They make it so damn hard for the people who need those support to get it and to put food on the table. And this technology actually, as we sit here and we think about the, the powerless, I actually think it has the power to give us more power than the rich and powerful if we can think about it strategically. Wow, okay. Who put this panel together? This is an all-star lineup. My goodness, thank you, Ashley, thank you for well. including me with these three incredible leaders who I know well. Uh, Dr. Wing has been one of my guides to this uh, very turbulent moment and uh, a member of our AI working group, very grateful for you. Um, the senator and I have something of a road show. 
Uh, we have done this panel literally around the world, if you count San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I learn something from her every single time. Thank you. Um, and, and my goodness, Rachman was like one of the most successful social entrepreneurs ever, uh, way ahead of the curve in understanding the need to connect young people to technology um, and uh, love what you're doing now. So, oh, very, very nice. Very, very nice. Um, so I am Mark Levine, the Manhattan Borough President from the Manhattan Borough President's office. Uh, it takes a lot to get me out of the Borough of Manhattan, but I'm here today for you, for you, because this topic is so important. Um, I've thought a lot about the incredibly wide gap between the magnitude of what is about to hit us and just how little the public is understanding or even thinking or caring about this. And I, I think it's because for the last 40 years, we've gotten very used to technological change. We had the personal computer revolution and the internet and the smartphones and social media. And it definitely changed society in a lot of ways, some very good and some very bad. But we've sort of assimilated this pace of change. And I think a lot of New Yorkers and Americans and people just look at the next few years and assume that it's going to be a similar pace of change when, in fact, we may see in the next five years more dramatic technological advances than we've seen in the last 40 years. It's very hard to wrap your head around. Uh, it is very hard for government to wrap its head around. And that is a government which couldn't really even keep up with the pace of the last 40 years. I mean, there are definitely hundreds of fax machines still in use in New York City government today. Uh, that is not hyperbole. And honestly, it's, it's only because of many of you in this room and, and Noel and, and the geniuses at, at Beta NYC and this movement that we've gotten as far as, as we have. But uh, I have to tell you that the challenges that you guys have been taking on for the last uh, 10 or 15 years are nothing compared to what we need you to do in the next five years. Uh, there's almost no aspect of city government that doesn't need to be reinvented and improved. There are hundreds of thousands of people in New York City who qualify for food stamps who do not receive food stamps. And almost all of them have a smartphone. And so maybe we could use technology to make it easier to sign up for food stamps. That, that would be life-changing for a lot of families. We have the worst housing affordability crisis in the history of New York City right now. And we do have affordable housing projects that are moving forward. They've got the property set out, and they've got the developer and the financing, but then they have to wait three to six months for HBD to process the loan documents and the term sheets, et cetera. Um, maybe technology could get that done in three to six hours instead of three to six months. Um, I could go on and on and on. But we have, we, we have an obligation to deliver more and better for people in need in this city. And there's no doubt that, that data is at the heart of it, which is the theme of this whole conference, and that machine learning gives us an opportunity to do this much better. Um, you know, we have a treasure trove of data in New York City government, which you guys have helped to, to make more accessible and cleaner and more useful. Um, so could we not use 311 data f accumulated over the last 20 years to make the, the customer service experience on 311 dramatically better? Um, could we not use some of the deep learning technology to look at wastewater data in New York City to identify the next emerging virus more quickly than we did the last one? I mean, fire data? to look at neighborhoods where we have to surge installation of, of home smoke alarms, there, there's an almost infinite number of, of possibilities. Um, but we are just not moving fast enough. City government is not moving fast enough. Elected officials are not moving fast enough. I mean, other than Kristen, I can count on literally one hand the number of people who would even entertain sitting on a panel like this. Uh, and, and, and we're in, a, we're in a, a state with hundreds of elected officials. Am, am I wrong? I mean, no. Yes, no, I am not wrong. I am not wrong. So I am very excited for this conversation and excited to work with all of you to mobilize to deal with the opportunities and threats ahead.
Can I just add something to your comments, Mark? Um, and I, I am speaking to this audience who I believe is very tech savvy and very eager to uh, embrace this generative AI technology and see how they can use it for good. Mark just gave me a whole bunch of ideas. Um, but I wanted to say that one of the biggest differences between this technology, generative AI, and just even the deep learning technology of three to five years ago is this technology can write code. So you can just tell it in the prompt, build me an app that will let me sign up for food stamps. Moreover, display those stamps so that when I go to the store, I can just swipe. That can be done in minutes. It doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take as much effort as it did just two years ago. So I would say, all of you are tech savvy, just start building those apps, yeah. building those services. It's easy peasy. It's so easy peasy that the computer science department at Columbia is rethinking how do we even teach programming to our students now. That's right. That's right. Oh man, you got to give us a chance to build the roads. <laughs> I'm like, we got to get to work, guys. Tall orders. Tall it, I mean, it, 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 yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's true through our experience of building paidleave.ai, how easy it was. Um, and if anyone's ever gone to, a, has anyone ever tried to apply for paid leave in New York? Here? Okay, nobody here. It is, yeah, wait, where? There. Right there. It was, how was your experience? Awful. Awful, <laughs> wow. Awful and hard. Um, and and, and the other sad part of the math, right, we don't even, I mean, the uptake of paid leave benefits in New York State is, could be as low as 2%, you know, as high, as high as 20%. So the vast majority of people whose taxpayer dollars have gone to pay for this benefit do not get it because they have an awful experience and they can't figure out whether they qualify and how much money that they get. And so, you know, we built a tool probably in six weeks, less than six weeks, where there wasn't a lot of risk because it was a, you know, a, 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 like a, the LLM was essentially the New York State paid law. So the AI could not, you know, grab information from the internet. There wasn't going to be a, a huge risk for hallucinations. We made sure that the tool was in every single language. Go figure, right? The existing New York State website does not do that for you. And it, it talks to you as if you're a friend. I mean, imagine if you are, you know, someone who just found out that they're having a baby you work at a bodega or you work at a, at a you know, at, a, at an employer in New York that's probably not going to be that excited that you're pregnant or willing to give you time off. So you can't go into your HR's office and ask a question. You're terrified. You may be a single mom of how you're going to put food on the table. But you can go to this website with all of that anxiety and fear and it will tell you in less than five minutes, am I eligible? How much money am I, can I get? And an action plan of what you can actually do next. Um, and I think, you know, your point is exactly right. Like, you can build this same tool for so many different benefits like SNAP and Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah, um, in all different languages. In all different languages. And, you know, we're already, and, and I think that the opportunity, so for the, for the government challenge, I'm so excited about Empire AI and the consortium that, you know, you're building because I think the opportunity now is that it's not just for us to, it's for us to work hand in hand with developers in the government to fix to make customer service not suck, right? So it is, you know, our goal, you know, at paidleave.ai is to work with Governor Hochul, work with Governor Newsom and a handful of other governors that we're currently talking to about saying, well, how did the generative AI tool actually increase the uptake of benefits? What did you learn about the existing law? Like, for example, in New York, you, one of the forms that you have to fill out once, you know, to get paid leave is like, basically a slip from your labor and delivery nurse. It's bananas. Maybe that's a bad idea that should be taken out of the law. So technology can also help make the law better and make it work for its citizens, which is what government is supposed to do. So, I mean, there's so much, you know, I think the partnership between government and developers and activists and technologists to like, I, actually make society work for so many people. So it's really exciting. Thank you, Rashma. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, like, how to articulate, you know, this next moment of change, and you already answered that. Um, so the next sort of 
topic that I really wanted to pivot to is, um, Jeanette, you brought up that generative AI can already write code. And it can be kind of scary in some ways, but it can be also a huge opportunity. Um, and I want to think about this like um, we as the authors, as humans, we are still responsible for the, the output of generative AI. So just because we can use a calculator to help us do like long division, um, we can use generative AI to help us build things. So I also want to talk about like this kind of ethical responsibility and accountability for that um, to create safeguards to make sure that um, like, you know, you've heard stories of, of a lawyer who wrote testimony and there was a, a fake case referenced. Um, there needs to be a sort of oversight and, and accountability for when you use generative AI. So I wanted to ask um, maybe Kristen or more Mark, like what, what are your takes on like how we can use generative AI productively uh, to improve practices? Sure. God, you can start. Okay. I mean, first of all, I actually like your analogy of the car. Um, I saw a, a video popped up in my, my YouTube feed, uh, an algorithm, of course, of 1940s New York City looking at the streets. Um, there were no traffic lights yet. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it was chaos on the streets. And, you know, you imagine today, New York City today, with no traffic lights. And the only people on the street would be like maniacs driving Humvees probably. So obviously we need guardrails. We need guardrails in every workplace in America, certainly every workplace in New York City government. And we have to be honest that these tools are being used in every office in New York City and every office of New York City government. Whether the boss knows, whether the boss is given permission or not, um, people are using it to write, to analyze data, to generate photos. I mean, it, it's happening. So we, we actually prepared a policy. Um, I think, I believe, we are the first city agency to do that, that, that establishes these guardrails for, for people working in the Manhattan Borough President's office um, that would allow for people to experiment for how these tools can make them more effective, but establish some very clear rules. First of all, that um, whatever goes out the door of my office, whether it is words or image or video or sound, a human being is responsible, right? There's, there's no saying, well, the AI did it, right? At the end of the day, uh, a human being is responsible for every word, image, or sound that comes out of my office. Um, we have uh, also establish rules on disclosure so that uh, if content is substantially created by AI, the public viewing or seeing or hearing or watching it will know. We'll have very clear labels of that. We're very concerned about privacy because of the nature of my office where we have a lot of constituents coming to us with their challenges and, and housing and employment and so much else. And so we established very clear guidelines on um, not putting any information into these systems that um, would be inappropriate for public release um, because we're just not sure of, of how these training runs are, are operating and we, we worry that um, we could inadvertently expose people's private information um, and more. We really tried to get the balance to, to allow people to, to find ways to use these tools um, to make themselves more effective, but to protect against the downside. Uh, we need to do that this, in, in every office in, in city government. Um, and you, know, you, can, you, can, you can see my, my office's plan on our website if you, for you to plagiarize it. Uh, we really hope that it starts a conversation on this. Yeah, um, I just also want to say, again, it's really exciting to have someone like, you know, Mark, the borough president for Manhattan, really championing this on the city level, because, again, there are so few, I guess, 
agencies or even electeds in government who have this enthusiasm and, op and openness. So very much appreciate the city level leadership because up in the state level, we're fighting the same fights, right? We have outdated infrastructure. Um, you know, it's certainly been hard to even modernize some of our own processes. Um, and it's, it's a frustration that I you know, hear from my constituents every day. Um, so I'm certainly heard and felt on all of the ways that we do need to step up as government and do better. That's why, you know, I ran for office. That's why I was really excited to, to be a, chairing this committee. Um, but I think, you know, just taking a, a quick step back, um, yeah, it's, it's when we talk about generative AI, when we talk about regulation, we do have to acknowledge that, um, you know, generative AI based tools are imperf inherently imperfect tools right now, right? And when we are thinking of implementing them in the public sector, it gets really tricky because our democracy, and this is getting existential, but it's true, you know, we, our democracy and trust in government right now isn't at an all time high, right? And so we want anything that is from the government to be of the highest standard, the highest quality, so that people can trust that the information that they're getting from us at all times is true and um, protected and again, can be trusted. So, um, so I think there is this right now, a, a real responsibility for us to think through how we mitigate bias, how we're building these tools, who's stewarding these tools. Um, at the state level, I have a bill called the Loading Act, and that bill is an infrastructure or government use of artificial intelligence bill. But because right now so many of the systems government uses when we talk about AI are like not generative AI, they're actually just existing types that we use in our lives every day, right? What we're really talking about are systems that are automated decision-making systems that to this day are also imperfect, that have bias. And so this bill is to literally retroactively look at these tools and say, hey, we need to do better, while also, you know, setting a good standard for saying yes and when and how, if we're gonna implement new tools with generative AI or large language models, you know, we need to be intentional about those use cases, right? We need we need oversight and transparency. If an agency wants to, you know, stand up a chatbot, we need to know, well, are you like what for what why like what is the benefit what is the public good any public dollar that we're using how does that go the furthest so yes we have bills to do that we also have programs and investments like empire ai where we want to invest in academia and actually start building up our workforce too right make new york a leader in research um but i think it's right now at least it's been we're, we're at such an early stage. It's certainly been a challenge to just say, or you know, if tomorrow we had 20 new generative AI tools that our state government certainly would have the infrastructure, like our ITS, our agency that handles that doesn't have the infrastructure. Um, and two, that, you know, we'd be doing it with the right use cases, right? We don't know the use fully, full all of the use cases we'd need yet. So we're still, it, it is, you know, government, we are trying to move forward, but we're trying to do so intentionally. Um, and then the last thing I'd add is, um, cybersecurity to this conversation. Generative AI is an incredible cybersecurity threat, uh, but it also can be a cybersecurity asset. So actually where we're motivated is to look at like one of our most pressing use cases, which is around protecting our data on the government level. So I think that's probably a first step because again, that trust is so important. Um, and then we're gonna continue building on that because there's still there is still time, right? Um, so I think that's a little bit about how at least our state government is handling it between investments, you know, legislation, and then also prioritizing safety. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kristen. I'm really glad that you sort of touched on bias. I think that's really uh, a really important topic when it com comes to talking about generative AI. And I guess I wanted to kind of pivot and shift this question a little bit to you, Reshma. Um, so I know that like um, there's you know, when facial recognition came out, um, we all know there was like a uh, bias where, where that technology could recognize like uh, white faces more easily than black faces. So we know that these algorithms are oftentimes sort of like built upon um, uh, data sets that have this in embedded bias in it. And I, I wanna kind of ask you like sort of two sides, like there's, there's bias in the technology itself that when it gets created. And then number two, there's sort of, um, when you think about 
who we build these tools for um, and who the audience uh, is, like who is using the tools, who is, who is the tool for. And, um, you know, coming from your background um, with like Girls Who Code, I know you've talked about um, how when girls are in the room, they are, you know, empowered and they sit at the table and they think about the projects that they want to create. I was wondering if you could like elaborate on that a little bit further. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's amazing, like Fei-Fei Li, uh, Joy Bolami, there's amazing, amazing uh, women in particular and women of color that are really kind of leading and speaking about al algorithmic bias and bias and, and generative AI. And Joy and I were actually just having a conversation yesterday about, you know, there's a difference, I think, between, you know, uh, like sounding the alarm on, on risk and ethics and algorithmic bias and then kind of... Um, and, and, you know, I think there's a, and then, you know, and then versus kind of a bunch of naysayers who are like generative AI shouldn't be used anywhere. Right. And I think really being able to establish the difference between the two, I think is really important as we're having these conversations. And, you know, I, I think your first point is about like, who's in the room building the technology. And as we say that gen AI, AI in general is here to stay. We need to make sure that women and people of color and poor people and immigrants are also building that technology. I mean, all of us remember <laughs> the New York Times story about the top 10 people in AI. It was all men. And, you know, that is deeply problematic. And, you know, an example of why it's problematic is, you know, think about when Lyft and Uber face first came out. You know, when Lyft and Uber first came out, there wasn't a button on the app that if you were a woman who was facing, you know, who had just been harassed or faced sexual violence, that you could press and alert and say, I need help. I'm sure for all the women who are sitting in this room right now, if we were sitting around that table building that technology, that's the first thing that we would have said that we needed to build. You know, it's the same thing with Google and Alexa. One of the greatest use cases of Google and Alexa is used by perpetrators of domestic violence to turn the music up real loud and to lock their partners out. So if we are not sitting around the table and thinking, you know, building the next 10 biggest use cases of generative AI, that technology is not going to serve everybody. And that's why, you know, at Girls Who Code, we are the access of, you know, every, even in New York City, I can trust you that all the kids in private schools all have their own chat GPT licenses. And every day they are tinkering and they're testing and they're building, you know, they're building things. Whereas, you know, kids in, in my public school, my son's public school, PS11, they don't. And so we're already creating an access gap. We already have a gender gap in chat GPT. 58, 52% of men have used chat GPT before compared to 36% of women. And part of the reason why women aren't using it is because we hear all these things that it's bad and it's scary. And I know we're rule followers. We just are. And so the, the messaging is really, really important. Again, if we all believe that this technology is not going anywhere, it's here to stay, and that we care about equality and equity in terms of who's building and who it's for. The messaging and how we talk about it is really important because there is real impact on fear mongering. We've, we've saw this with the gender gap in technology. And your second point is, and I think this is what you're saying, I love, you know, I believe that you always build for the most vulnerable. You know, when I built Girls Who Code, I started with going to public housing and refugee camps. And I said, if I can teach a girl that doesn't have a computer, that doesn't have Wi-Fi, if I can teach her to code, I can teach anybody. And so I think as we're thinking about, you know, what are the things that New York State should build, I think we should think about what are the 10 biggest problems for everyday New Yorkers, whether that's housing, right, whether that's, uh, f you know, food stamps, whether that's paid leave, right, and then do exactly what the UK just did last week where they, they launched an innovation fund where they invited social entrepreneurs to come and pitch their biggest ideas on climate. You know, that's, I think, a really powerful opportunity and role for the government and to also then make sure that we're starting with the most vulnerable, that we're solving for the most vulnerable. I, I wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, I'm probably the oldest person in this room <laughs> who's actually a female in computer science. Um, and I, I wanted to share a story with you. This goes way back to the probably the 80s when I was attending a conference held by a federal funding agency called DARPA. 
and they were um, showing a demo of a speech recognition system. And this was phenomenal. I mean, we, we could not get machines to recognize our speech because it, every, it basically got every third, every third or every second word wrong. And you'd say something and it, it just wouldn't figure it out. But at this demo, and this is through the research that they funded, they had this speech recognition system. And I got so excited. You know, I went up to it and I wanted to speak into it. And then the person who was manning the demo said, oh, no, no, it doesn't recognize female speech yet. <laughs> and I was so disappointed. <laughs> I said, there you go. Yeah. So that's my. This has been my life. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see girls who code. Um, but I can tell you so many stories about my life as a female in computer science. Um, but back to generative AI and bias and fairness and so on. Even before generative AI technology, um, and I would point to probably the last 10 years of technology that's coming, been coming out, people like Joy and Fei Fei have been um, alarming and alerting the general society about the potential uh, bias and unfairness of these algorithms and these models. And I just wanted to say that from a technical point of view, it's actually very difficult to solve, mm. extremely difficult to solve. The first and foremost problem is we cannot come to consensus on what fairness means. Yeah. So a few years ago, again, before generative AI, one of my colleagues at Princeton had a YouTube video called 21 Notions of Fairness. And each notion had a mathematical definition. And you could feed in some model or some experiment and say, fair or not, per definition. Moreover, for some of those definitions of fairness, they were inconsistent. In other words, you could not build a system that would satisfy both of those notions of fairness at the same time. What that meant was you had to choose from the very beginning, well, what notion of fairness do you mean? We're talking about mathematics, you know, what you would encode in a so already it was difficult. Then I was sharing this story with a colleague of mine in the law school. And he said, Jeanette, it doesn't matter what you guys or gals <laughs> say is fair or not from a technical point of view, from a mathematical point of view. If you build me an automatic decision system and say it's fair, because in the court of law, it's not going to hold up. Law is intentionally ambiguous. We need that wiggle room. We need to allow the human beings in the court of law to interpret for the case at hand. So it doesn't matter what your automated decision system says whether and, and whether your verifier says it's fair or not. And this is already beyond like the 21 notions of fairness that we can mathematically define and encode in some and that you've had. So already just from that point of view, it's difficult. Now from a more practical point of view, it's also difficult. And let me get, give you two examples. One is when I was still working at Microsoft, we put out an early chat bot that none of you heard of. <laughs> but many, be, some of you have heard the story. It was called Tay. Yep. We put it out. Within 24 hours, we had to take it down. Why? Because it started repeating the ugliest language of the dark underbelly of the internet. The most offensive language, you, it was horrible. That was way before LLMs, way before generative AI, even way before a lot of the deep learning stuff. The good news is we learned, a, well, my, we, Microsoft learned a lesson from that and immediately stood up an internal ethics board, which would look at designs, use cases, technology coming out, and determine how to design, co-design with ethics in mind. So that was a good thing. That was a, a lesson learned, and I think Microsoft actually continues with that good practice. 
But it raised the issue of how difficult it is to deploy a technology with all good meaning behind it, good intention. So the second story is, of course, more recent. And this is the Google, Google story. story. Yep. Um, where we know, I know, um, a lot of I have a lot of friends who work for these tech companies. They were former students, after all. <laughs> I know that Google engineers were well-meaning when they deployed and, and, and that, I guess, that Gemini system at that point. And then all the horrible, inappropriate <laughs> images that were being displayed that were historically inaccurate and just, again, it just goes to show even they were trying to do the right thing, but even that's so difficult to do. So from a technical, mathematical point of view, it's difficult. From a practical scalability point of view, it's difficult. Can so I just say one thing on this? Um, <clears throat> I mean, that, that's, I hope someone's recording that because that was a phenomenally powerful account of, of the technical and philosophical challenges for generative AI. But I think the story is very different for a different role of AI, which is pattern recognition or labeling, which is what facial recognition is. And there, I, in 2024, am actually less concerned about those systems being inaccurate than I am about those systems being mind-blowingly accurate. I mean, the, the advances in face, facial recognition now, has anyone used PIM eyes? Anyone know this app? Clearly, no one here is under 21. This is a, a free facial recognition. Uh, well, you, have, you have to pay for premium, but where you can you could take a picture of someone on the subway or in a bar, and you just upload, upload it to PIM Eyes, and it, use, using facial recognition, will link to their entire social media or other photo content on the web. So you can, you can pierce anonymity quite easily. Uh, Clearview AI is the professional version of that. And uh, being used by police departments, by the way. Um, but you know, they, they have a, a civilian version, which they're, I think, teetering on whether to release, that's embedded in glasses. And so I could look around the room, and that technology, I could see who was sitting in the room, and connect to your Facebook account. And you know, it's, it's not just facial recognition. Um, there's a paper that came out a couple months ago about looking at rooms where there's a lot of Wi-Fi, which is almost every room right now, and you can see silhouettes of the figures between the walls, right? Uh, so a wall is no longer a protection for, for anonymity. There's been uh, a lot of papers that look at um, kind of supposedly anonymous postings on the web uh, and can see the patterns and connect it to the actual author. And it's very interesting if you look at Sam Altman, who uh, at this point I think we can admit has had a, an anonymous Twitter account. Um, and he was apparently like sort of much more unguarded and radical uh, and kind of pro-accelerationist, I believe, in his postings there. And he is now, I think, realized that he's going to be unmasked or outed at some point because this technology will, will analyze the writing style of anonymous accounts and the writing style of accounts with names and, and put them together. But I mean, what does this mean for whistleblowers or anonymous court records or, or people reporting domestic violence in a way that they, they, they want to remain anonymous? What does it mean for a teenager now to be out in the world and know that someone can use PIM eyes and, and uh, immediately identify who they are and you know, maybe even where they live because if you have a full social media profile, I mean, are we okay with this? I'm not okay with this, uh, but this is a problem of these systems being too accurate and it's only 2024 and these are gonna get easier and then they're gonna be open sourced and I know we have a lot of open source devotees in this room, but you know, what happens when PIM eyes is open sourced? And Clearview AI is open sourced. So we have to be incredibly vigilant about the bias built into these systems that were trained on bias data that have unrepresentative people building and running them. And I mean, I, 
X, X 1000 to everything you guys just said, but I have other fears as well that we are not currently addressing. Can I add one thing to that as well? I think in so many of the models um, that we've seen other either countries take or, you know, the, the risk guidelines, even the U United States has, right? We have like a NIST framework. So we have like a national institute that has these like risk standards. It's always, again, a risk-based approach to AI or generative AI. But I think what our office has struggled with is that assumes that we're just, again, mitigating shades of risk. What's the right amount of risk? What's the right amount of fare? But I think in this moment, what we really need is a rights-based approach. What are the fundamental rights that we are establishing for ourselves that we are trying to protect and have that be a North Star that guides what is okay, what is not okay moving forward. And to come to that like rights-based approach, we really do need to have a conversation that takes into account, again, the most marginalized and vulnerable communities. And so our another thing, again, in our legislation that we're trying to do is start setting up these red lines, the right to privacy and the right to a private right of action. If there's a decision that's made by a government use of, you know, an AI based tool that you have some recourse, right? It's not the end all be all, but there are so many other fundamental rights that we're trying to add on to that. And I think that's, this is important to note because all of you are so, your voices are so essential to that conversation or to this conversation, right? Um, and then the other thing I, I wanted to bring up that hasn't, that we haven't super talked about yet, is misinformation. You know, um, when we had a mass use of, of existing types of AI, like algorithms, and we think about social media, right? Social media has pushed our democracy to the brink, right? It has, it, it has pre presented some really new challenges that I think we are all still living with, right? And when we think about generative AI and the ability for misinformation, it is on a scale that we've never seen before. So I think what we've heard so much is that there are existing systems, whether it's bias or misinformation or you know the, the digital divide or the gender gap that exists, we're still struggling with, but now we're dealing with things on a whole other level. So again, these conversations become so much more important. Um, you know, in our, in the state level, I have two bills on election use of, of generative AI based tools, campaigns, you know, deep fakes has been a, a conversation I'm sure you've all seen in the in the news recently. Um, but I think all of this is to say that, you know, we are, we have usually two camps. We have the 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 doomers and the zoomers, like AI, like that they're like, it's it, this is the worst, we need to take it away. And the zoomers that are like, tomorrow we need to do all the things. But What's really been healthy and what I really appreciate in this panel and conversation is that midpoint of like, how do we take the next step together where we're keeping like every, we're engaging people from across the sectors. And again, how do we do that intentionally for the right purposes, for the right people, for the right things. Um, and then when we do that, it does, I think, support the underlying, what are the rights that we're protecting for the society that we're trying to build in the future, which is not a surveillance state, yeah. right? Yeah. I think a great example of that is like, had we known, like the Instagram like button, you know, when, 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 when Facebook created that button, they tested it on girls and they were trying to figure out how to make the technology as addictive as possible. And so they knew, I don't know, dec a decade ago, right? The, the what, that technology was going to do to increase suicide rates, you know, for girls or self harm, et cetera. And I think you can see the same thing potentially happen, you know, with Gen AI. We don't want our kid. I want my kid to learn how to do math. I'm not giving him a calculator yet. You know what I mean? So there is like conversations that we do need to have of what we've learned in the past. You know what I mean? That's created harm and the types of regulations that we need to have on Gen AI now uh, to make sure that we don't have it, especially when it comes to our children. We are just about at time, so I just want to wrap it up and then I'll give you all an opportunity to make one quick statement. We would like, to, we're almost at like five minutes. It would be great to give, give the audience a chance to ask uh, a couple questions. Um, so thank you all for, um, you know, touching on some of these really uh, great topics like Jeanette, like this idea of fairness and, and like, you know, the, the technology doesn't have an ability to assess like what is fair, what is good, what is true. This leads into false information. We talked about uh, advocating and protecting the most vulnerable. I know that uh, 
Mark's initiative uh, is into the you know New York City pushing for a New York City Center for AI Safety. I know that Kristen, you're involved with the False AI Representations Act. Um, so we're all kind of like on the same page here. And and sort of the final question uh, that I leave for you is. Uh, what can we do now to lay the groundwork for the future of public interest AI? Thanks. No. <laughs> Two sentences. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I, as the academic, um, I will say the obvious, which is I think we really need to increase awareness of this technology and train and educate um, everyone, all citizens of New York and beyond, um, what the capability of this technology is and what the limitations are. I mean, that sounds like a very obvious statement, but to reach every New Yorker is, is a, a scale, scale problem. But I think it is about awareness and training. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, oh man, uh, yeah, it's, it's a collective process, the awareness. The like getting, making folks understand just like how, I think everyone sees it in the news, but just like how it impacts, like it, it's not going to, no one's going to be untouched by this. So like having that vested interest. Um, but for me, I think I'm just still, I love these conversations and still going back to the fundamentals of our society that is very, <laughs> it has a ton of inequity. Um, so how can we, again, or with urgency, bridge that digital divide. Universal, we have a bill uh, for shelter Wi-Fi because not every temporary housing or shelter facility in New York State has Wi-Fi. We have, um, yeah, bills around uh, digital equity. And I think we need to do that. And then we also need to acknowledge that there are people in the city who can't afford, like this is a big conversation, but like can't afford to put food on the table tomorrow, right? Or like can't afford to keep a roof over their heads. And so throughout this conversation, how are we still again, all of with all of this opportunity, bringing that back, because I grew up in a one bedroom apartment in Queens. My mom was a single mom. My dad passed away when I was very, very young. Um, and I think there's so much here that could have helped with like guiding her through a social uh, safety network, but that assumes that we have a robust social safety network to begin with, which we do not, right? And I think what ultimately she could have used is an affordable rent, living wages, right? A union job, which she eventually got, um, and just, yeah, for me, it's still building the, cis, the foundation with all of you so that we the can. Roads, the literal roads so that we get there. Yeah. That wasn't two sentences. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, I think, I, I, I guess my dream, my goal is to truly build tech for good and not tech for good because tech is, did something bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think this is an opportunity for us, you know, to really kind of have this new technology and to start with the most vulnerable, build aspirational AI and use it to you know, solve the problems of our, of our most vulnerable. Amen. I'm gonna use my two sentences to talk about a topic we really haven't had a chance to touch on here, which is the, 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 the urgency of pivoting public education in New York City, K to 12 education, to prepare kids for the world they're gonna be graduating into, and we have just done almost nothing on that. Right now, 70% of kids in New York City public high schools graduate without a single lesson in computer science in their high school career. And maybe there's a class on machine learning somewhere in the 1500 public schools. I haven't found it yet, but we just have to change everything about what we're teaching, how we are teaching, how we're running the school system. Huge opportunity here, but we don't have the luxury to let this play out over the next 40 years. We've got to move urgently. The stuff I want to see in place by September, so that we're preparing these kids for a very different workforce, a very different world that they're going to be graduating in. And how about we start by unbanning ChatGPT, which now, as you said, is banned in two thirds of schools, right? So the rich kids, no, public schools. Right, right. forgive me, right. two thirds of New York City public schools. The rich kids have their laptops and they have their home computers and they have their uh, unlimited data on their Wi-Fi, on their, on their cell phones. And kids who are relying on school devices and school networks are not even allowed to experiment and learn about these tools. But when they apply for a job, they're going to be competing against people who know how to use these tools. So we're doing them a tremendous disservice. Don't you do something about that, Mark? We're, we're, we're working on it. The senator and I are working on it.
<laughs> all right, thank you all. Now we are at time. It has been such an honor to have you all here today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.